Hello guys, my name is SCB and I'm back with another video. And today I want to do a real deep dive into the Overwatch ladder. Those of you who watch my stream will have seen that I've been playing a fair amount of Overwatch ladder recently. And there's a few things that I've noted down now that I kind of want to get my thoughts out on because there's a few problems that I've noticed that I really think need addressing, especially before Overwatch 2 comes out, whenever that might be. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to spell out all the problems that I see with Overwatch's competitive mode. And it might end up turning into a little bit of a rant once I get going. But I don't want this to be a negative video. I want to be as positive as I can. So at the end of every section of every significant point, I'm going to try and point out what I think would be the solutions to each of the problems identified. Now for this video, I want to start where it seems all of Overwatch's problems always end up starting these days, the role of tank. Now everybody knows we don't have enough tank players and that is at least in some part a motivation for why Overwatch 2 is going 5v5. So I'm not going to harp on about that part of it. But there is something that's been happening a lot recently that I think needs to get spoken about. And that is tank players getting pulled into lobbies way apart from what their SR is. So to give an example, my account is in Midmasters SR and at any given time I can get pulled into a top 500 lobby as easily and as likely as I can get pulled into a plat lobby. And sometimes I have plats and top 500s in the same lobby with me. So now from a playing experience, it's not really fun for anyone. The plat player in that situation is not going to have any fun because they're going to be playing against people who are significantly better. They're not going to really learn a lot. They're probably just going to get stomped. And for the top 500 players, it's not really fun either because they're playing with someone with such a different understanding of the game that it's almost like speaking a different language. It's basically not playing Overwatch at that point. But from a competitive point of view, it creates a big problem, which is that it basically destroys the integrity of the competitive mode. The entire reason of having a ranking system is that you say, okay, these players are of this rank and they should be put together. And these players are of this skill and they should be put together. Now, when you stop doing that and when you're pulling people together who ordinarily you wouldn't even let queue together, what you're saying is we no longer have any restrictions for what is a fair or balanced lobby anymore. The game is so desperate to just make a match that it's putting, you know, pretty much anyone in the game together right now and saying, okay, well, we took a GM and we took a plat, we mashed them together, that's balanced. And we'll put two masses against them and that's fair. And obviously anyone who's played in those kind of situations knows that that's just not fair. And I know this isn't just happening in masses. This is actually happening in all ELOs where there's so few tank players that they're getting pulled from all over the rank spectrum just to fill and make any sort of game happen. Now I sympathize with Blizzard because this isn't directly their fault. The reason the matchmaker is doing this is because there just isn't enough players. Now of course, why aren't there enough players? Well, that part we can blame Blizzard for. But here is where the problems start to compound. I'm going to add the second problem before I talk about the solution. And the second problem comes from the off-roll SRs. And this is where everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked or when Rolock was introduced. Now, for those of you who don't know, if you have an account that you had placed before Rolock was introduced, the matchmaker will then basically put all three of your roles at that SR. So I want to use my own personal example for this one again. So before Roblox was introduced, I was sitting in High Masters, Low GM in that kind of area, but I had never played DPS to any significant amount. I would pretty much only play tank or support. Now, once Roblox was introduced, I continued to play tank and support and I got my SR for those roles, but it wasn't until about three seasons ago that I ever decided to place my DPS for the first time. So we're talking like 15, 20 seasons worth of time. And the reason I didn't do this up until now is because I knew what would happen I knew the matchmaker would place me way too high and I would eventually end up just throwing people's games and lo and behold, when I did finally do my placements, the matchmaker put me at 3800 SR. Now remember that 3900 is the absolute cap that anyone can be placed and that's even if you were 4.5k the previous season. So for my account, which had basically zero DPS hours to be placed at 3800 because of my SR for my other roles is frankly quite ridiculous and again, kind of undermines the competitive integrity of the whole mode. Now this isn't even a hindsight Andy kind of observation because when Rollup was introduced, a lot of people were bringing this exact issue up and they said to Blizzard that, you know, we need to look into this issue. It, it will be a problem later down the line. Unfortunately, Blizzard didn't do anything about it. And now we're kind of suffering for it. Now, while we're rolling down this hill, I want to add one more problem before I actually get to talking about solutions. And that problem is priority passes. Now in theory, priority passes are meant as a reward for playing whichever role is underserved, but let's be honest, priority passes are basically you play tank for some games, we'll give you passes you can play DPS and support quicker. Now inherently this idea is not a problem, there are other games that use similar systems and it can and does work. The problem we have in Overwatch is twofold. Firstly and more simply is just the number of passes. You get six passes for a win right now and one pass for a loss. Now if you ask me, I think that's absolutely ridiculous. 
even if you're absolutely awful at tank, just by the nature of the fact that it's a team game, you will win a game every so often in Overwatch. And for six passes, you can basically afford to throw quite a few games and still come out on top in terms of your waiting time as long as you get those six passes. Remember, you get one for the loss anyways. And I think the problem this has created is basically pass inflation. Now, only really Blizzard will know with their backend data whether this is actually happening or not, but from observation, it feels like nowadays with the queue times, at least when you're playing at any time that isn't absolutely optimal, you basically need to have a priority pass to not be having a ridiculous queue time. It feels like pretty much everyone has a priority pass or feels obliged to get one because the difference between a priority pass queue time and a regular queue time is so high that it's basically become mandatory. So if everyone has a pass and if everyone needs to use a pass, then we've kind of defeated the purpose of this whole priority pass business, haven't we? And this is now where the problems start to compound on top of each other. Because the people who are playing tank now for these priority passes do not give two shits about the game. This is where we have a big problem named Roadhog, where I'm sure you guys are feeling this in your own games right now. Every other game features an instant Roadhog lock, if not more than every other game. And that person playing is usually a DPS player, not really interested in playing with the team at all, barely interested in playing tank, that's why they've locked Roadhog. And overall what it's doing is, what I'm finding anyways, is just making the game less enjoyable. Because chances are, they're not even at the right SR for their fake tank that they're locking. Again, to use my example, it, it's probably the equivalent of someone who was, let's say, master on DPS for their entire lifetime. Rolock comes in, they get put on master on tank now, and they're locking Hog at an elo where they've never played tank significantly. They're just running around flanking, playing him like a budget DPS. And at that point, it just feels like we're shoving a tank into the game for the sake of making a game. But if that game is in fun, then what's the whole point of all of this? And again, this is that fundamental point that I keep coming back to is that it doesn't really feel like there's any competitive integrity left anymore. We're just throwing a lobby together. Doesn't matter whether the tank's SR is plat or GM, just throw them into this lobby. On top of that, it doesn't even matter if their off-roll SR is accurate or not, and they could just lock hog, play DPS, and essentially get free six passes for nothing. And then they use those passes to inflate everyone else's queue times because they're now using the pass. Now there's even more consequences to this that I'm going to get to in a minute and there's even more problems that I've identified. But before we get too deep in the negative train, I want to talk solutions. There's two simple solutions to this. Firstly, an MMR reset. Now this is obviously tricky to put into the current game, but when Overwatch 2 comes out it's basically mandatory. They haven't necessarily said anything about it, but I can't imagine that they won't reset everyone's MMR and SR come Overwatch 2 because it's basically supposed to be a whole different game, it's a whole different playstyle. It makes no sense to me that they wouldn't reset everyone's SR. So that's something that should already be coming as a fix and hopefully as well with Overwatch 2 we'll have a lot more players playing which will fix the need to draw tanks from varying SRs into the same lobby. And with one less tank needed we'll hopefully have a much more fair balance between the roles and how popular they are. But the second problem which I think could and should come right now is the number of passes per win and loss. My take is that the number should be something like 2 per win and 0 for a loss. And I know some people will say well why would you even want a priority pass then? And that's kind of the point. Me personally, I don't think people should be hitting the flex queue icon if they're not actually willing to flex. Because right now what it feels like is people hit the flex queue icon as a give me priority passes for whatever the hell I want to do. And they go about playing what they actually want to play. The idea of being flexible is surely to reward the people who can and want to be flexible. The flex queue I thought was designed for people who, let's say, wanted to play support and DPS sometimes but we're also happy to play tank and so as a reward for playing the tank and filling everyone else's lobbies and playing let's be honest the least fun role their next game when they play dps to support they get a slightly quicker queue time just as a thank you for keeping everything sane keeping the whole system working and now i honestly feel like it's broken down because like i said it's just a bunch of dps or support players flexing onto tank not really knowing what they're doing not really caring what they're doing they're just in there to get their six and at worst one pass so firstly, lowering the numbers and lowering the loss number to zero should disincentivize people who aren't actually willing to play for a win and who aren't actually capable of getting a win. Because if, you know, a lot of people, as they do know, they know they're not likely to get a win unless they just get carried. They queue up anyways because, hey, at the worst, I get one pass anyways. And maybe I'll get lucky again in a couple games, just the odds. In a couple games, you'll sneak a win and you get six passes for free. Great. That's six games of DPS I can play now. So 2 to 0 is fine in my books. It rewards the players who are actually willing to flex and also kind of deflates the number of priority passes we've got flung around everywhere. So that now having a priority pass is actually probably meaningful. The less players that have it, 
the more meaningful having the pass becomes. And so you should actually see a pretty significant uptake in the queue times that you have. And now, and this is why I think the priority pass should have been trying to encourage all along, the people who want a priority pass have to do it for meaningful intent, right? It's no longer possible to just queue up for the odd game and try and sneak a priority pass. If you want to play tank, if you want to get those passes, you better learn because it's going to be really punishing otherwise. You better learn how to actually play tank or you're going to find if you keep losing and losing and losing, you're not getting any reward for it. So the play itself should be its own reward. And that's, I think, what the priority pass should be encouraging. Now, here is where we have to introduce another problem. And that is what I was alluding to with the Roadhog example, is that the tricky thing with Overwatch is that even characters within the role don't necessarily translate to the other characters in that role. Roadhog is one good example where Playing Roadhog really doesn't teach you much else about most of the other tanks. Like playing Roadhog has little to no transferable skills on playing Reinhardt, on playing Winston, on playing Orisa, playing Wrecking Ball, playing D.Va. Maybe you can say Zarya and Roadhog, they're quite DPS-y tanks, so they have some unity to them. But largely speaking, it's not transferable at all, and that's why you see so many Roadhog OTPs, I think. But it isn't just Roadhog. Another great example is Mercy or even Moira, where... If you play and spend hours on Mercy and Mora, that doesn't necessarily transfer over in your ability to play Zen, to play Lucio, to play Ana, to play Bap, or even to play Brig. They're all quite different heroes to what Mercy and Mora provide. So the problem this creates is twofold. Firstly, when you are flexing, when you are forced to flex off, or when you choose to flex off, your ability in the game has now shifted drastically. So we'll all know, for example, if you end up with, let's say, two Mercy mains in your lobby, and only one of them can lock Mercy, you've now got a problem. Because one of those players is going to have to play a hero that they're significantly worse at, that they weren't matchmaked into this lobby for. Remember, let's say they are a diamond tier Mercy, but actually a gold tier Ana. Well, if you force them to flex off Mercy, now they're performing at, you know, a thousand SR worse than what the matchmaker said they should. So in those situations where that player is flexing off, the matchmaking is now completely thrown off as well. And the other problem this creates is what we might call meta boosting. So basically this means that when a character's power level fluctuates, that person's ranking can fluctuate simply by the strength of the character. So we've seen this in the past sometimes with characters like Orisa, for example, who when she suddenly becomes very strong, you see people rising a thousand SR or something. And then when she's suddenly nerfed, now they've been pushed up into this higher SR, the hero is worse, but their essential ability to play the hero remains the same. Then you end up with one of two options. One, they flex off to a different hero, and now we're back to the same issue. That player's ability on that role is not accurately calculated by the matchmaker. Or the second answer, which a lot of people do as well, is SR camping. Now, SR camping is what I would basically describe as when people don't play a lot of Overwatch, but they want to keep their rank. So what they do is, they tend to play maybe just their placements in a season, or they'll do their placements every other seasons, or they'll do, you know, let's say five games, they get their placement and then they'll do another five to ten games over the course of the rest of the season. Now, the benefit of doing that is it basically mitigates risk, right? If you only play, let's say, five games a season, but statistically speaking, I would say a really bad win rate is like 40 percent. If we see we go ten games, that's basically four games that they won and six games that they lost, meaning a net loss of two. And that means 50 SR or something, 25 to 50 SR. So by playing only five games a season or let's say 10 games a season, you're kind of making sure you can only realistically lose somewhere between 25 to 100 SR maximum. Now that means you get to keep the shiny badge you're after. So you get to keep the plat badge or the diamond badge or the master badge, whatever it is that you covet. You get to keep the badge because you're not going to lose that much. But the problem that it creates is that for those five games, for those 10 games, again, that person is just completely compromising the competitive integrity of the match. My take on Overwatch, and I don't think it's a particularly hot take, I think most people would agree with this, if you're not playing, you're automatically getting worse. The nature of such a fast paced and highly competitive game is that you constantly need to be honing your skills. You constantly need to be keeping warmed up to actually be able to keep up with the people who are doing that, who are grinding Overwatch for a lot of hours per week, per month, per season. So when you dip in and out, you're essentially throwing a spanner in the works of the matchmaker every so often by saying, OK, well, I am plat, but I actually haven't played in five seasons, so I probably should be silver. But here you go. Here's a silver in your lobby. And again, we know this to be true in any other domain, right? Like, can you imagine a sports team who, let's say they get crowned champions one season and then decide, OK, well, for the next five seasons and iterations of your tournament, we're not going to turn up. But when we come back five seasons later, we expect to still be the champions. Like, that doesn't make sense. But I think bringing that same expectation into Overwatch is kind of bizarre. Because again, to take the example of my DPS account, having not played for 15 seasons on this role, 
The matchmaker still said, yep, you're still as good as you ever were. And that's patent nonsense. We know that if you're not playing, you're not getting better. And you're actively getting worse. So SR camping needs to go. And again, you compound all those problems on top of each other. What can happen? Well, you meta boost yourself in a certain hero. Let's say one season Genji is really strong. You climb up 500 SR on Genji. Then Genji gets nerfed. You stop playing. But from now on, every 5 to 10 games a season, you come in and you throw those 5 to 10 games because you're essentially 500 SR worse than where you should be. But you're coming in, playing in the lobby, getting your placements done, keeping that shiny badge. And again, making everyone's experience slightly worse. And that's kind of what Overwatch has become, it feels like. Everything is just slightly compounding together to make it all slightly worse. And when you put it all together, it just feels horrible. But again, we're not just going to criticize aimlessly. Here's my solutions both of which I think might be considered controversial. The first, maybe less controversial one, is that there should be SR Decay again, but rather than the old system, so let me quickly explain, there used to be SR Decay in Overwatch down till Diamond, so you could drop to the lowest of 3000. And I think it used to be something like you would lose 25 SR per day if you hadn't played in the last nine days. So if you log, didn't log in for the 10th day, you'd lose 25, then another 25 on the 11th day, another 25 on the 12th day, so on and so forth until you drop down to the base of Diamond. And the problem with that system was that it basically forced people to play way too regularly, right? Playing every nine days is not necessarily possible for some people. And let's say you take a break, you take a vacation for a little bit, well, you might lose a lot of SR. And now you might have the same problem where you're not as bad as your SR is reflecting and now you're slightly better than the lobby, etc., etc. You get the picture. So what I think we should have instead is seasonal decay. And the way seasonal decay would work is that you basically have to play 25 games per roll that you want to keep your SR on unless you want it to decay. Now, why 25? Well, 25 is the number that it takes to get top 500. So if that's what we're saying is this is the minimum number of games we need to ensure that you are actually deserving of this SR or deserving of this rank, then that surely should fit for not decaying either. So basically over the course of a season, you got to play 25 games. If you don't, then your SR will decay by a certain amount. Now. That might sound a lot to some people, but I really don't think it's unreasonable considering that seasons last for two months. If you can't play 25 games in two months, then can you even really look me in the eye and say you're as good a player as you were two months ago? So that should basically end up being an automatic reset on people who do get, let's say, meta boosted or people who just haven't played the game for a long time and come back in. They aren't automatically thrust to their previous rank and therefore ruining everything for everyone else. And I think it keeps things a lot more tight. Now, as to the other problem about certain heroes that don't transfer well to the rest of their role, here's my radical solution. First, we remove hero switching. Bear with me, bear with me. And second, rather than queue up per role, you basically select from a list of heroes that you want to queue up in, and then you get an individual SR for each hero. Now, this is a radical idea, I know. I haven't even fully thought it out myself, so I kind of want to throw it out to you guys and hear what you have to say. And if there is some fatal flaw, then I would love to hear it but do hear me out in this full thought process. I know there's people who feel like hero switching is core to Overwatch, but is it really though? There are things in the past that have been described as quote unquote core to Overwatch that we removed. Remember that initially on release of the game, you could pick any character you wanted. So you could have six Winstons as a comp and there were realistically comps that were like five Winstons, one Lucio or five Divas, one Lucio or five Tracers and one Winston or something like that. And originally the devs said, we want anyone to play whatever they want. That is core to Overwatch. And then they realized that was madness. They stripped it back and they added hero limits. And that's when we ended up having, you know, goats, triple tank, quad tank comps. And again, the devs said, this is a little bit too much. Although we want anyone to be able to pick whatever they want, provided someone else hasn't already locked that hero, we still want the game to play relatively sanely. So we're going to introduce 2-2-2. Two, 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 and that ensures that all the roles are getting played and it allows them to balance things easier. Now, fast forward, going towards Overwatch 2, the devs said, okay, well, actually even two tanks is a bit of a problem. When they pair together, they make a lot of issues. It makes it hard for us to design tanks. It makes it hard for us to create new tanks and balance them properly. So we're just gonna go down to one tank. So I think we should be receptive to the idea of changing something fundamental again. And at the pro level, hero switching already is non-existent. The thing about Overwatch is one of the biggest factors is ultimate economy. So switching your hero in the middle of a game it's almost always a bad idea because whatever you lose in alt economy is not worth the gain that you get from switching your hero. So you will almost never see a pro team switch their comp with any significance at any point in an Overwatch League game. Now I know the other counter argument that people will bring up is, well, what if you get locked out basically by a poor pick? So what if your pick gets hard countered? 
And there's two things I'd say to that. Firstly, that already happens. Again, if we consider the thing that we've just spoken about, right? When there's a lot of people, and this isn't even an anecdotal thing. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people who are near one tricking. They're essentially soft locked, right? They're probably not going to switch. They're not going to switch no matter what happens, no matter what you say to them, no matter how much you flame them, no matter how much they get hard countered. They're basically playing that hero anyways. So those players are getting hard countered anyways. And also be honest with yourself. Most of us resonate with that to some degree or the other. There's not that many players that can honestly say that I'm as good on every character in this role as every other one, right? We all have our strengths. You might feel you're a fairly flexible tank player, but maybe your Reinhardt is platinum level and your Winston and your Diva and your Zarya is only gold level. So if your Reinhardt pick gets hard countered, you're already performing at a suboptimal level. So the idea that you can get hard countered out is already a thing. But here's the other point. Come Overwatch 2, this is something that the devs are already trying to remove anyways. The devs, if you've noticed the recent balance decisions over the last two years or so, the devs have already been trying to remove the idea of hard counters. I think the changes to Reaper are a good example where Reaper was for the longest time pretty much exclusively a tank buster, right? He was just amazing at shredding tanks, Roadhogs, Reinhardt, those kind of characters with the big hitboxes. But since then, they've added progressive changes to just make him a general duelist. Now, he is still really good at killing tanks, but he's pretty mediocre at it as compared to what he used to be. And now he's a lot better at dueling other DPS too. And we can basically expect this to be the path furthermore for all the changes that are going to come in Overwatch 2. Again, that little brief experimental patch that we saw when Junkrat got his changes and he got fall off damage was with that same idea, right? They didn't want Junkrat to necessarily be a choke spammer. They wanted him to be another duelist. And that's what they want all the DPS to be, all duelists. The same way they want tanks to all be brawlers and they want supports to be able to help with some sort of form of DPS and aggression. So hard counters are already kind of being nerfed in Overwatch 2, which means that the likelihood that your hero pick gets locked out by virtue of the fact that you queued up for Reinhardt and enemy team had a Reaper, well, that's already less of a problem than it ever was and will continue to do so in Overwatch 2. Now, those are the negatives. What are the benefits? Well, the benefits are a much more accurate SR system and a system where basically no one is being forced to play a hero they don't want to play. So when you queue for a hero, your SR is exactly right. There's no fluctuation. You will be playing that hero in that game. Now, you might say that there are certain synergies that make a hero stronger or weaker, and that's true, but that will always be true to some extent in any way because you can naturally have synergies with certain players where a certain player is very good at syncing up with you and happens to coordinate really well with you, is calling out and is on the perfect harmony. Now, we can't always facilitate for that, but having a stable SR for that hero is really important, I think. Secondly, it avoids the problem that two players are basically maining the same hero, right? So you'll never end up with two Mercy mains or two Widowmaker mains or two Farah mains. And thirdly, it allows you to actually better reflect your hero pool in the people you decide to lock. So not everyone sees themselves as a tank player or a DPS player or a support player, right? A lot of you, and I know this to be the case, a lot of you are players who say, okay, well, I can play Monkey, I like playing Sombra, I like playing Baptiste and I like playing Zen. Like those are the heroes I want to play. Now, on balance, you might say that there's two supports there. So you're a support main, but actually I don't have any interest in playing Mercy. I don't have any interest in playing Moira and I actually really like playing Monkey. So now rather than having to decide a role and then being forced into an awkward position, because let's say you get locked in tank, but you only wanted to play Monkey and you don't want to have to flex the other tanks. Now, when you queue up, you're basically queuing up. These are the heroes I like to play and you're guaranteed to get one of the heroes you like to play. So when you combine these solutions, you can see how they start to solve a lot of the issues that really plague us in Overwatch ranked. So if you add the SR decay per season, now people can SR camp and it also removes the idea of meta boosting. Because let's say Reinhardt gets giga buffed and all of a sudden you gain a thousand SR. Well, if you want to camp that SR, you can't once he gets nerfed, because if you don't play, you're going to lose SR anyways. If you do play and now it's clear and exposed that you were only boosted up to this rank because the character was stronger, not because you got any better you'll start to lose your games once more. So it's a lose-lose situation for the people who are inflating their SRs through means they shouldn't be. And it's a win-win for anyone who's actually capable of hacking it at the rank they are. So yes, it is a big change. Yes, there are potential downsides. But anyways, that's one solution I think that could really push Overwatch forward into a modern direction. And later down the line, it allows for much more elegant draft systems. <laughs> the SEB video bingo card. But yeah, I think it could be a good direction for Watch, And I definitely think the seasonal decay should happen anyways. Now, I'm aware I've already ranted for a long time, so I want to bring up one final set of problems and one final set of solutions, and that is the inability to play with your friends properly. 
one of the biggest problems with Overwatch right now is essentially if you want to play with your friends, you are heavily punished for doing so. What do I mean by that? Well, basically if you form a stack with your friends and you hit Q on competitive ladder mode, the game is only going to put you up against other stacks. Now inherently that seems fair, but the problem it creates is that it is essentially giving you harder games at the same SR. So let's say you're platinum and all your friends are roughly platinum. When you queue up together and you're put up against another platinum six stack, you're all playing much better than your average solo queue game, right? You're all coordinating. Presumably you've all kind of complemented each other with your picks. And even at the very least, just talking to each other should raise your level by quite a lot. Now let's say you lose a couple games and you drop 50 SR. Now when you go back to your solo queue platinum game, that game is much easier and it becomes much easier for you to climb because an enemy team that's super coordinated is punishing you for every mistake but these random solo queue guys who can't even get along let alone coordinate they're not going to punish you for those mistakes so suddenly you find yourself winning 100 sr 200 sr and you climb again then you go back and you stack with your six stack flat friends and back to you go to these difficult games and you end up losing a little bit of sr once more because also if the matchmaker can't find you another stack to go up against it's going to put you up against much more mechanically competent solos. So again, if they can't find you a plat six stack, they might give you three diamond duos. And those guys will just mechanically outplay you. So you look at that situation as a player trying to gain as much SR as they can. And the simple conclusion they would come to is that playing with your friends is a waste of time. Because you're getting harder games and you're not necessarily getting any more SR for it. So what's the incentive? Why play a harder game for 25 SR when I can play an easier game where I can do more more easily for the same amount of wins? So that is a problem, but here's the other problem that it creates. It also invalidates everything about Overwatch and all the systems within it. Because Overwatch is meant to be a team game, and yet if the latter system says playing solo is the best way to climb, what we end up doing is we encourage an entire player base of players to play the wrong way. It's supposed to be a team game, it's supposed to be about doing things together, it's supposed to be about helping each other out, but solo queue says basically look out for yourself, try and do as much as you can on your own and forget about your teammates. And that's how we end up with people who are in Diamond, who are in Master, who are even in GM, who don't really understand the fundamental principles of the game. And when they're actually asked to play Team Overwatch, when they're actually asked to do things together, or let's say they're asked to play a certain comp, they simply don't know how it functions, they simply don't know what they're supposed to do, and they just lose because they're only used to playing solo queue Overwatch, and they take their team down with them. So overall, the quality of Overwatch deteriorates. The game looks a lot less like it's supposed to do, right? Compare any random solo queue game, even a GM, to what an Overwatch League game looks like, it's night and day, not just because of the disparity of the player base, but just the kind of things that are going on. And the other bad thing is, systems like Looking for Group and the eventual clan system that is almost certain to come in Overwatch 2, become completely meaningless. Now going full boomer mode, I'm old enough to remember when Overwatch first introduced Looking for Group. And I can tell you guys, for those who weren't there, that first like month or couple weeks when Looking for Group was first introduced, was hands down the best time Overwatch ever had in terms of how players behaved. Because around the time they introduced Looking for Group, they introduced endorsements as well. So everyone was going into Looking for Group, everyone was looking for a six stack, they'd find a group, they'd play together, they'd coordinate, they'd have great fun games, and they'd endorse each other and everyone was trying to be really nice. There's lots of sportsmanship, GG, good game, well, good shot, you know, well played, you outplayed me. Honestly, it sounds like some sort of fake utopia, but that's genuinely what it was like in Overwatch for a couple of weeks. But then here's what happened. Everyone realized I'm getting harder games here. I'm playing a level of Overwatch that I'm not used to at all. And meanwhile, when I don't use looking for group, when I just queue up on my own, I'm getting easier games. Why do this? Why go to all this effort? Why wait that extra time in looking for group till the six stack fills up just to get a harder game and lose when I can just take an easy solo queue game and win? So if that is still the mentality when Overwatch 2 comes out and when clans comes out, what's the point of being in a clan? Why would you ever want to join a clan and team up with people when again the fundamental issue remains? That playing with other people makes the game harder. Isn't that bizarre? Isn't that bizarre that in a team based shooter, playing with other people makes your experience worse? That's just something that's fundamentally really off about Overwatch so until that changes, any systems that they introduce to make the player base better or nicer to each other is going to fail the way endorsements eventually did, the way looking for a group did and the way clans might do. And the extreme solution to this, and I've wondered about it for a while, is to simply say we don't care what the number of your stack is. So the way this would work is the matchmaker would put no consideration whatsoever into how many people are in a stack, they would just continue to match you as normal. Which would mean that potential solo queues can end up against potential six stacks. The benefit of that is, you should have to learn the game to progress. Now, you won't be able to climb unless you can deal with people stacking and playing together. So if you don't know how to play proper Overwatch, you'll be hard stuck. And to be honest, that feels fair to me. 
But I think the overall better solution is just to have a separate team queue. I think tournaments are fine, tournaments are nice, and I'm hopeful that they will come in Overwatch 2. I don't think it's enough. I don't want to have to just wait till the weekends to play with my friends. I want to play with my friends whenever I want to, and I don't want to feel like I'm being punished for it. And that's where the team queue really helps, I think, because being given a separate SR, basically, you get a separate SR every time you team up with a new set of people, and while your individual MMRs would influence it, once you get your SRs, that's it. And that way, you can play a proper version of Overwatch where you're being matched accordingly to your skill as a 6 stack, and you can keep your solo QSR so that when your friends do log off, and this is the problem with having the everybody plays in the same system model, when your friends log off, it doesn't change anything about your individual SR. Because otherwise, you might play with your friends, gain a bunch of SR because you're stacking and you're coordinating, and then let's say not all of your friends are there, you can only play as a two, now you're going to suffer because you're not all playing together, and your SR is going to go back down. So it's a bit of a fiesta. Instead, you have your solo and duo SR. That's where a lot of games operate by. You have a solo and duo queue, and then 3 plus is a separate queue. And so that way you can have your casual SR, as we might call the solo version, and your sweaty tryhard SR when your team queue. And that's the way I hope it'll be viewed. I hope that people will see the team SR as a real testament for your ability in Overwatch. Because while solo and duo queue is great, while it might give you some indication as to the mechanical competence of you as a player, it really tells you nothing about what that player knows about how to play Overwatch. But either way, I really want to see players be able to play with their friends, have fun and not feel like they're being punished for it. So I think a team queue has to come. <sighs> okay, that's all my rants for now. I'm going to pause the video here because I think I've said more than enough and there's a lot to digest there. A lot of crazy ramblings. So I'm just going to pause the video there. I'm going to say that if you have any feedback on any of the ideas, whether good or bad, it would be nice if you didn't completely flame me, but please do leave a comment in the section below and I'll try and read as many as I can. And if you've enjoyed this video, have enjoyed my silly hot takes, then please do consider liking, subscribing, and if you want to support me directly on my Patreon, which is awesome, I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreons who do the amazing job of supporting me and allowing me to continue to make videos like this. But I think that's it for me for today. I'm going to call it there. Thank you guys for listening, for joining me, and I hope to see you guys soon.